territory of the Squamish. We're coming to you from the unceded traditional territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations here at Britannia Art Gallery for our artist talk with Luca Appel. He's a mixed media artist and currently exhibiting at Britannia during the month of April. His exhibition is entitled Daybreak. And uh, other than that, I'm going to leave it to Luca to take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Luca. Uh, I am a self-taught artist, um, originally raised in Missouri, uh, but been, have been living the last eh, five, six years in Victoria, uh, and then moved to Vancouver about a year ago. Um, this is my first sort of solo show. I've done a lot of group shows in the past, um, but this is my first sort of big exhibition. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to everyone about that. A um, uh, quick spiel about sales. If you're interested in any of my work, please feel free to contact me uh, via my Instagram or my email. Um, and you can find prices for everything at the gallery and I'll be posting that on my Instagram uh, shortly as well. Also, um, we will be having a question period at the end um, but if you can't stay for the whole talk and you have a question, feel free to pop that in the chat and I'm sure I can answer something. Without further ado, uh, let me share my screen and let's get on to the show. All right. So I've titled this show Daybreak for several reasons. Um, firstly, it's a new day in my art, a new dawn in my practice. Secondly, it's a new life for upcycled materials. Um, the mixed media work that I do uses a lot of recycled things, uh, whether it be thread, whether it be wreaths, whether it be pieces of old furniture, so this show, these works are breathing new life into old items. But I will get to all that. First of all, beginnings. Um, I've been painting birds for as long as I can remember. There's just something about their grace and coloring that's really inspiring to me. When I was a kid, my parents subscribed me to National Geographic magazine, and I loved looking at all the exotic birds in flight. The first image on the left is actually a painting done off a reference image from one of those magazines. Um, I'm entirely self-taught, and in 2014, when I painted this, I was just getting into acrylics. This is probably one of the first paintings in which I attempted anything close to realism. And it, you can tell, <laughs> um, but I'm still really proud of that piece for, Reporting in progress. for when, uh, when it was created. The second piece uh, was done in 2017. I was improving, but gradually. Um, the main reason being is that at this time I had started university and moved to a new province. Um, a lot was going on and art was still really a hobby in my life. So I wasn't taking a lot of time to focus on it um, and therefore wasn't improving as fast. Uh, that changed around 2018. I started doing a lot of little pop-up shows, uh, pop-up shows and group shows. Um, and that started to make me consider art as something that's maybe more, maybe less of a hobby and maybe more of a, a secondary source of income um, or even a career. The piece on the right is actually the first piece that I did in my sort of- Jacob, hey, can you come here? Um, so basically a friend of mine, gave me a little three inch by four inch piece of canvas and I couldn't figure out for the life of me how to fit it on the Look. And- Can we just uh, wait a minute, Luca? Can some, can everybody check their mic and make their, sure they're off that? It's just that it was interrupting. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, uh, I ended up cutting a hummingbird out of cardboard, gluing it to the canvas so that the wings extend off the canvas. Uh, I had that in the Victoria Arts Council's uh, holiday group show, I think in 2019. The years have gotten fuzzy since COVID. <laughs> Um, and that ended, up, that ended up selling within 30 minutes uh, in the opening reception. And so I realized, okay, maybe this is something that people are interested in. Maybe this is something I should do more of. So that led me to doing precisely that, doing more of that. Um, as I continued making these little four by four inch pieces, which I call my littles, um, I evolved a bit. I started adding upcycling ele upcycled elements uh, like branches, uh, and I started carving them out of basswood or balsa wood uh, instead of cardboard. Um, I've gotten really into wood whittling recently, and I think that's a direction that my art is going to move towards, which I'll talk about a bit uh, later on in my presentation. So that gets us to Daybreak. Um, this show differs a bit from the pieces that I just talked about, mainly in size. Um, like I said, my previous pieces have been about four, four inches by four inches. Um, this one, Horned Owl, as you can see, is 20 by 25. Um, I realized that if I wanted to do a solo show, I needed to make works that were larger and therefore had more impact, um, which presented a lot of challenges for me. First of all, uh, lumber is expensive. <laughs> uh, and second of all, there's, a, there's an element of stability, of extra stability that you need when you're making something large um, out of mixed media, which can be quite heavy, or at least the, the mixed media that I do um, than if you were making them really small. So Horned Owl was my first attempt uh, at this. Uh, it's sort of a play on words, giving a Horned Owl actual horns. You'll probably notice that a lot of my pieces have little uh, plays on words or, um, I don't know, jokes in the titles. Uh, I try not to take myself too seriously. So. In this piece, the horns are made out of wire, um, wire and plastic and paper. Uh, and then the strings hanging down are actually from a deconstruct deconstructed scarf, uh, which I took apart. Um, and they're all attached to my acrylic owl here. Now this owl is actually uh, my second attempt at doing an owl. The last time I tried one was in 2014 and you can really see my improvement. I love this side-by-side -side comparison because of that. Uh, the first one was one of those that I had done off um, a National Geographic reference picture and I didn't know much about color theory uh, and I didn't know much about depth and shading. Like I said, I'm entirely self-taught. Um, so the owl and the tree in the background are all the same color. Um, there's really no shading, no outlining. Um, it was like I, like I said with my previous older piece, it's still really good for when I made it. Um, but in comparison, there's in comparison, there's no comparison. <laughs> um, Now, the second piece I want to talk about is Leaving the Nest. This is also a foray into textiles. Um, in fact, the thread that creates the nest in this piece is uh, comes from the same scarf that I used for Horned Owl. Um, so they really work. They work really well as a pair. This piece was inspired by uh, an experience I had as a kid. Um, in our family home in Missouri, we had a family of birds nest in one of our hanging floral baskets. 
um, and we got to watch them hatch and take flight for the first time. Uh, so this piece was inspired by that and also just by my love of uh, complementary colors. I love combining colors that are complete opposites of blue and yellows, um, pinks and greens. You'll see that a little bit more later on uh, in my show. So working off the same color palette, this is Kingfisher. Uh, Kingfisher is a bit unique because it's the only piece in this show which is made to exist inside a frame. My thought process for this was that sometimes my pieces can be difficult to hang alongside pre-existing works in people's homes because they extend beyond the canvas, because they're not a traditional shape, they may be hard to level, they may be hard to fit onto a wall. So I wanted something that would still fit within a frame while still being three-dimensional. So the reeds and the thread still protrude forward off the frame. It's still 3D uh, while existing within a frame. Now the frame is upcycled like usual. We got it from Value Village. Uh, <laughs> this piece also uses a lot of natural elements. So the reeds are real dried reeds. Um, the grass is real dried grass. Uh, and then I also have upcycled thread. This one, I believe, was from a different scarf, if I remember correctly. This piece, like a few of my others, also evokes happy memories. Um, we had a pond full of reeds uh, behind my house growing up, which my family and I would walk around basically every day. Um, and we would watch birds land on them uh, with the reeds swaying in the wind. And with, and I, I tried to capture that image with um, the moving grasses, which actually do move <laughs> in the wind. Now we've come to Through the Looking Glass. This is probably my favorite piece in this show. Um, this piece was, all right, there's a, there's a story behind this one. So I found this tea cabinet on the side of the road. Or tea cabinet, I call it a tea cabinet, but it could also be like a key cabinet that you could hang on your wall. I do this a lot. I find furniture on the side of the road. I find furniture, I find clothes, I find basically everything. I like to consider myself a magpie. Um, so I found this tea cabinet and I brought it inside and I used it to hold at first my tea and then eventually some paints. Um, and I still have the rest of the cabinet, but the door was sticky. The hinges didn't work too great. I guess it was old. Um, so I ended up taking the door off, but the door still called to me. It wanted a function. So I decided to make it into art. I removed the glass backing um, and replaced it with canvas board, which I then painted. Uh, I stained the whole thing and then used sandpaper to weather it to make it look that dark stain while still allowing some of the previous grain through. Um, I used gold leaf on all the edges which was my first foray into gold leaf. Um, and then again, I used natural elements, uh, real branches to create the branches, which I painted um, both that dark brown and that bronze color. Here I have some more details of that piece. Uh, these birds are snow buntings. You don't see them here. Um, they live in the Arctic tundra. Uh, but if you're into birds or birding, I would recommend looking them up. They're absolutely gorgeous little creatures. This piece is also one of those that has inspired new ideas for me. Um, so with my other pieces, I talked about previous works that inspired those works. This work is a work that is, inspire, that is currently inspiring new works. Um, I have this idea of 
creating a full size door. Um, I feel like that would be super cool and both both functional and beautiful. Uh, and obviously time consuming, um, but I, I do love a challenge. So um, when I'm able to have a studio of my own, a proper studio, that's not just my bedroom, uh, making a full door is, is gonna be on one of my, is gonna be one of my priorities. Tooth Fairies is one of the smaller paintings uh, in this show. And again, it's another example of one of my silly little concepts uh, that I turned into art. Like I said, I don't like to take myself too seriously. Uh, the idea behind this was, what if uh, tooth fairies were just birds? <laughs> um, these, give me one second. These are nut hatches. Um, they're capable of walking entirely upside down. So you'll often see them like walking head first down a tree. Uh, and I kind of like the idea of them sort of walking head first down your bedpost on their way to grab the teeth from underneath your pillowcase. Um, I don't know why I love teeth so much. I did work at a dental office as my first job in high school. Um, I was a dental receptionist um, and my mother was a dentist. Maybe that's why. Uh, but there's just something silly um, and joyous about this piece, which makes it another one of my favorites. Although I probably say that about most of my pieces. Uh, this one, once again, uses gold flake. Um, I felt the gold flake worked really well with this piece because it's reminiscent of gold fillings and cavities. And just adds another element of whimsy. So here's another comparison. Um, this one's not a direct comparison, but it's similar colors, similar poses of a piece that I did in 2019 and a piece that I did this year. Then again, technically last year, I think it was 2021 when I completed uh, Tooth Fairies. So my lines have gotten cleaner. Um, I've gotten way better at carving. Um, and I think I'm able to imbue more of my personality in my works these days. I was really hesitant early on trying to make things sellable, trying to make things that were appealing to other people. Um, and I've really gained the confidence to make works that speak to me, make works that just come into my brain and still be able to um, game recognition um, as an artist. So this piece is two in the hand and it's precisely an example of that element of whimsy uh, and personality in my work. Two in the hand is probably, probably my most whimsical piece out of this show. So there's a lot going on here. Um, the feathers or the wings, I guess, are pieces of Christmas garland, which I got from the bargain bin. Uh, then the, the wings are from tissue paper. Uh, the arm is made out of, again, tissue paper and then wire. And then obviously there is thread as well as some chain uh, hanging from the hand itself. Um, this piece is another one that has given me inspiration for future work. I'm kind of thinking of creating a whole show or series of disembodied arms, disembodied legs um, with the same sort of floaty element. I. I don't know. I don't know what I what interests me about. There's something that interests me about human anatomy disconnected from the human. I don't know if that sounds creepy, um, but it just fascinates me. And I would love to explore more of that in my work. Now, this piece has also evolved over time. This piece had a predecessor 
which is pictured here. And once again, this comparison allows you to see my evolution as an artist really clearly. Um, this early piece, like I said, I didn't have a lot of confidence um, making things that showed my weird personality. I thought people would think it was too weird. Um, and so it's it's very simple. It's very simplistic. Um, and I was never fully happy with it because of that. Also, you can tell that I've just improved in my knowledge of bird anatomy <laughs> uh, from here to there. The next piece I'm going to talk about is Moss Hopper. This is another one of my smaller works in this show, although not as small as my early works. Um, I don't have too much to say about this piece other than this is a great titmouse. That is the actual name of the bird. And this one also uses a lot of natural elements. So the moss is real dried moss. Uh, there are real pine cones, um, which you can see in the corner there. There's also some upcycled thread um, and some some faux uh, branches, um, which are the ones that are sort of coming up along the side. I had a lot of fun working with and layering textures in this piece. It's one of the reasons that I do mixed media. Um, I get a lot of joy working with my hands. Um, Again, why it's why I've latched on to carving, uh, carving and whittling. And it's why I have such a barrier uh, moving into digital work. I've done a little bit of digital work in the past, but it just feels so disconnected from my traditional practice that I find it difficult. I feel like I need a, a bridge. I feel like I need to dabble in watercolor, watercolors or something before I can, I can um, properly foray into anything digital. But I will never, I will never lose my love for mixed media, um, precisely because of that joy that I experience. It's also calming. Um, if any of you are thinking of exploring mixed media, again, that that grounded feeling that you get from working with your hands is really calming um, and alleviates a lot of the anxiety that I experience in my day to day. So I'd really recommend it. All right, now we're going to talk about Murder of Crows. This piece uh, was a struggle for me. Um, I had this concept to depict a crow fight, which is something that crows actually do. Um, they battle over territory and they battle over food. Uh, you can look up videos and pictures of it online. Um, I wanted to depict that. I wanted to depict the movement of battle while still making it beautiful, while still making it include other elements of nature. But I really struggled to capture that. Movement is something, movement is, is difficult to put into still form. I know that that may, seem, that may sound silly, um, but it's true. So here on the left is my original concept sketch for this piece. Uh, I wanted to have, this was, I came up with this piece when I was in my foray of textiles, when I was doing horned owl, when I was doing leaving the nest. So I was using a lot of thread. So I had the idea of having red thread connecting them. Um, and I, I ended up scrapping that. Uh, the reason being is there was too much going on in the left corner and nothing going on in the right corner, and it just felt unbalanced. Uh, and then I also realized that hanging two separate pieces that are still connected by thread is a gargantuan task uh, that I didn't really want to burden a buyer with. So I moved to two disconnected pieces. 
Um, and you can see the progress uh, on the right. And once again, I ended up scrapping the coloring that I was using here. I was going for a rustic ball look, um, but I realized that I couldn't get the, the movement and the idea of being in flight if the background was too heavy. So I hemmed and hawed over it. I probably repainted the background around 16 times. Uh, it was a lot. And I eventually settled on the wall color uh, in my living room. <laughs> so I don't know if you can tell here, but the background on these is the exact same color as my wall, uh, which is just a standard gray, which is going to be the same gray as a lot of people's homes. Um, it really makes the background fade away. It makes the crows stand on their own. Um, another difference that I did between this progress piece and the final is that I ended up painting the leaves. Uh, when I mixed the orange background concept, I decided to remove most of the orange um and make it more black and yellow i felt those cooler tones um the the cooler tones of the black and the cooler tones of the gray on the background better encapsulated battle um than something warm and rustic uh i also want to quickly talk about the feathers um the feathers on the wings in the one bird as well as the feathers on the tail in the other are um, once again made from a wreath which I snagged from a thrift store uh, in town and then there's also various wire um, and various wood pieces um, to create as much end movement as possible. Now, bird. So this title is probably the most obscure title, the title that people don't really get. Um, it's a bouquet of birds, hence bird K. Um, it's silly, I know. But again, that's what I do. Um, this is the last piece that I made for this show. And probably my second most time consuming um the reason being the flowers uh flowers i used a special technique in which i pour acrylic paint over glass uh let it dry peel it up and then i fashion those into flowers this is a technique that i used previously in a piece that i made in the summer um, to create a floral jellyfish which I will show in a second. So hopefully you can see that. It's a video of me peeling up the acrylic. It just comes off in this really satisfying sheet, which you can then mold into practically anything because it sticks to itself. Um, it's latex. That's a video. Of Flowers. Uh, and then on the right, oh, give me one second. And then on the right here is the uh, original piece where I first used that technique. Uh, it was a floral jellyfish, which I made out of packing peanuts uh, for the core, and then used that peeled paint technique for all the flowers. As and then um, the tendrils were plastic wrap. So let me go back here. So that's how I made the flowers in this piece. The pistils of the flowers, so the yellow parts that stick out, are all cut up paper. The leaves, once again, are from deconstructed wreaths. And the hummingbirds, like usual, are carved from basswood and painted. Um, the hummingbirds 
Hummingbirds are something that has an element that has been in my work for years. Uh, and I've improved not only in realism, but also in the speed in which I can do them. I used to second guess myself. I used to take days and days to paint one of these. Um, these three I painted, I think, in two days. So a lot faster. Um, oh, and another thing I didn't mention is there's also thread included in this piece um, as the pistols of the little pink flowers. Uh, one more note about the birds in this one. These are a special kind of hummingbird uh, called Anna's hummingbird. Um, I actually have a friend named Anna who's going through a bit of a life transformation right now. Um, and I was creating this piece at around that same time. And I just felt that was really fitting um, to create a piece where birds are emerging, uh, emerging from a bouquet, emerging into an unknown world, uh, emerging into something new. All right, so I've talked super fast, like usual. Uh, <laughs> But uh, now we have time for questions. Thank you, Luca. That was fascinating. I hope, uh, um, yeah, let's open it up for questions now. Luca, um, oops, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, just, hi, Luca. Um, just wondering when you're sourcing your stuff out, do you just take little trips out in nature and find uh, some of those other things there, like those pussy or not the pussy willow, the reeds and stuff? Or did you actually just have to go find them or buy them? How do you source those things out if you're not just finding them on the side of the road? Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of both. I, I do a lot of value village shopping. Um, right, right it's never looking for a specific thing. It's always, I just go and I peruse and I find things that give me ideas. So my process is, it kind of goes both ways. Either I find the thing and the thing gives me an idea or I have an idea and I go looking for the thing. Um, so the reeds, the reeds I did find at Value Village actually, they were just like uh, in a vase I don't think the reeds themselves were up for sale. The vase <laughs> were for sale, but the reeds is what I wanted. That's uh, all right. Get what you can. <laughs> uh, and then other things I, I do sometimes find in nature. I go for walks, um, and that's where I found the pine cones that I used in another piece of mine, uh, as well as the moss, I believe. Um, yeah, thank you. Good question. <laughs> Oh, did I unmute myself? <laughs> yeah, you should probably mute yourself. I okay. think. Of course. Um, Luca, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, do you paint your birds from photographs or the, the um, or um, drawings in books? Just yeah. could you tell us a little bit about how you do this? Sure. Um, I originally used a lot of uh, reference photos. Um, like I said, when I was beginning, I used a lot of National Geographic references. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I just started using Google images as references. I also have a birding book, um, which I use. But as I progressed, I don't really need references for uh, bird anatomy anymore. I know how to structure a bird. Um, these days I really just use references for the coloring um, for each different species. Um, mm -hmm. But for just the, the general shape, I can do that just off memory. Um, and then for the, the species coloring is where I, I consult some references real quick. And you mentioned um... But what kind of wood do you use to make the birds? Basa wood or bass wood? It's what either, is that? It's either Basal. balsa wood or bass wood. They're both very soft woods. Uh-huh. Um, and where do you get them from? Where do you get them from? 
uh, Opus, Opus Art Supplies. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's not very mysterious, is it? No. <laughs> I don't know if every Opus has them, uh, but the Opus that mm -hmm. I use has is a, a bin um, where I get them from. Uh, and you just I, use the carving tool. Yeah. But you know, uh, yeah. Let me see if I have my knives around. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, let's see. So I just have a set of three uh, along with a sharpener. So this guy here is really good for large cuts. This one here is great for fine details. And then I also have a scoop tool like this. I don't use this too often, um, but it's really popular for people who are starting out with carving and making spoons, um, like making wooden stir spoons. Mm -hmm. So that's primarily what that guy's for. Um, mm -hmm. I'm planning on experimenting with more types of knives uh, in the future. Um, but this is Do you get those? Um, Opus as well, the knives, do they come from Opus? I think you can buy knives from Opus. These ones I got off Amazon. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what this is leading to, don't you? <laughs> yes, you're you're planning something, aren't you? Well, yes, but I'm, I'm also wondering if you would, if you would be open to engaging in some kind of workshop so you could yeah. work as some of something like this. It would be an opportunity for the rest of us to be creative, to be involved in wonderment and, you know, just to create something of ourselves and to have your, you've been through the whole, pro, you've been through a process and you're still developing, I know, but. Yes, yeah. Yeah, mm. uh, I've taught workshops before. Um, mm -hmm. I've never taught a carving workshop. There's a bit of a barrier mm. to teaching carving. First mm -hmm. of all, you need knives for everyone. Second of all, there's the there's the safety uh, and mm -hmm. liability. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Frick, you That's very nice. You can buy cut resistant gloves, um, which you can also get off Amazon. I don't know if Opus carries them, but I know Amazon does. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested mm -hmm. in Poland and want to be extra safe, um, but also just the same precautions as carving an apple cut away from you uh, will do you wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, you're kind of, you seem a little hesitant, but maybe maybe sometime in the future when you're yeah. more, you know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, oh, right. one other question, please, whilst I'm here. As I purchased some of your beautiful work, um, you mentioned something about hanging, like some, uh, I, I um, Am I, am I going to anticipate rightly or wrongly that this may be a challenge hanging your beautiful work without frames on my walls? <laughs> no, so they're all wired in the back. They hang mm -hmm. exactly the same as any other painting. Okay. Um, yeah. What I was referring to is if you have square paintings next to them, sometimes it's uh, arranging them can be a struggle. Um, okay. The actual hanging process, they are properly wired on the back. They hang okay. precisely like normal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Mm -hmm. Waiting for questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, when you're picking your colors, Luca, if you don't mind me asking, mm -hmm. um, you know, I see how you were saying how you do complimentary. Um, is that uh, something you're playing with more and sort of getting into something a little bit more, you know, like split complements and playing more in that direction or playing with the color theory and, you know, cause I like your color combinations. They really are quite nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have been working with split complements recently. Um, I really like the blue, purple, yellow combo, um, which I think I had like twice in this show. Um, <laughs> a lot of it is just experimentation. It's just as I'm creating the thing, playing around with colors, redoing the background a few times to figure out what just feels right. Um, 
it's tricky because I try to use the original coloring of the birds. I try to make the birds as realistic as possible. Uh, and then it's trying to find a background color that works with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but definitely my, the, the color theory and the color um, combinations that I've come up with, I did learn a lot uh, from working in the paint industry um, and recommending colors to people. Um, I'm, I, I use that on a regular basis in my art. Nice, nice. And when, can I ask another question? If you're, um, what made you choose certain birds? Like, what is it about certain birds? Is it just the way they look or the way they act or is it? Um, a bit of something. both, mm -hmm. mostly the way they look, uh, like I said, I have a birding book, but I also just follow a lot of bird photographers on Instagram. Uh, and I find ones that interest me and I go, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna put these in a painting. Um, sometimes it's the name. So the horned owl had to be specific. Uh, and then the nut hatches, the ones that are able to walk head first down a tree. Again, those were specific, um, but everything else, uh sometimes it's the type sometimes it's the color combo that i want to work with that day or yeah. sometimes it's just i saw a picture of a beautiful bird and i want that bird on my painting Thank you. <laughs> uh, anybody else have questions uh yeah just wondering what you have in mind for your next project Oof, that's a tough one. Uh, primarily, I'm looking to go more into folk folklore. Um, I have this idea of taking, um, so, okay, a little bit of background. I'm Polish um, and Poland is very Christian Catholic currently, but it used to be um, Slavic pagan. Um, and so I have this idea of creating some large uh, portrayals of pagan Slavic folklore creatures um, using the same sort of upcycled carved um, process. Uh, the main difference being number one, they wouldn't be birds. Uh, and number two, I would really try to focus on stain and use stain more than paint. Um, my, the reasoning behind that is that these are such ancient creatures that I would want these works to look more rustic, uh, hence using stain um, to showcase the grain of the wood and to make them look a bit more ancient and give them that gravitas um, that I think they deserve. Uh, these pieces, another difference from the current works is that I, I want something large and imposing. Um, so my plan is to make them three foot by four foot, so quite big. Um, I've actually applied to a grant through Canada Council um, to help fund this project because, like I said previously, lumber is expensive. <laughs> uh, and the wood that I would need for this, I could not get at Opus. Uh, so keep your fingers crossed for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's my, that's my current next project. Uh, what kind of challenges would you face using stain instead of paint? Ooh, a few. Uh, expense is a big one. Um, I can't buy them in tiny, tiny batches. Um, I'm going to guess you can. Anyway, expense is still a struggle. Um, and then it would also just require a lot of experimentation to figure out how the wood takes different stains. Um, I'm planning on probably using pine, although that'll depend on the availability uh, when it comes to doing my project. Um, and before I start I'm going to have to test out every single stain. Um, and I imagine I'm going to have some difficulty with depth 
um, I won't be able to achieve the same variation uh, as I can with acrylics. So I imagine it will be a challenge. Um, and I imagine I'm going to have to improvise a little bit. Um, but that's the fun of it. Um, that's part of what I love to do. Um, so there's going to be a lot of challenges, but I think it'll be worth it. All right, I think that might be all the questions. I think hey, well, so. thank you everybody for joining us. That was um, great, Luca. Thank you for your fascinating talk. Um, Luca's work is going to be up until the 29th down at the Britannia Art Gallery. That's at 1661 Napier Street, if folks don't know that, in the heart of East Vancouver. The hours of operation are on the website. And if you're interested in purchasing work from Luca, you need to talk with him personally. His business cards are there. And I think, Luca, you said that you asked people to reach you via Instagram and I can't remember the other one. Uh, and my email. And your email. Is your email on your business cards? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, that's great. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Luca, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.